Hi, welcome to the Chris Fair and Dana Reed Foundation's Live Better series. I'm Julie Levinsky, Manager of Web Production. Um, today we are with Candace Cable. She um, will be talking with Don Rogers about some outdoor, outdoor adventure and recreation. So I'm going to pass it on to Candace so she can tell you a little bit about herself and about Don. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is uh, this is a real treat for me. But um, you know, to be perfectly honest, every webcast is. This uh, Live Better series by the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation is giving us an opportunity to meet some people that are part of our community and they're out and about doing things in life. And so this program is called Adapting Life. And during this time, we really get to find out about the person that we're spending this hour with and some of the things that, that they're doing that are enhancing their lives and can enhance our lives. And our guest today is Don Rogers. And Don is, I mean, I call Donnie, I call him Donnie, because <laughs> we've known each other for quite a long time. Um, he's the professor of play. He is the chairperson of the Department of Kinesiology, Recreation, and Sport at Indiana State University, and has a PhD, and that's why he's the professor and the doctor of play in leisure and a master's in recreation therapy, outdoor emphasis, both from Indiana State University. His undergraduate is in recreation therapy from the University of North Texas. And he has an AAS in engineering design and drawing from the San Jacinto JC in Texas. He's also a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. And Don and I met, um, we met, I don't know how long ago, at the organization Turning Point Extravaganza. And this is a place where one day people with physical disabilities get to come out and try all kinds of different activities, indoor activities and outdoor activities. And Don is usually in, involved with the zip line because he has been the go-to guy with creating outdoor recreation for people with disabilities when it comes to climbing towers. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. But first, just after his spinal cord injury for about 16 years, Don participated in wheelchair sports, including road racing, track, basketball, tennis, racquetball, and touch football. He tried all these different, different activities. And his professional focus was always in the outdoors. And he was really committed to inclusive adventure-based programming and organizing camping. He helped design challenge courses since 1982. And since his first course on an outward bound program, he has been professionally active at the state and national levels in creating the experiential education. And he works with the Association for Challenge Course Technology. He worked for six summers in organized camping for youth with disabilities at the Bradford Woods and works with Roland and Associates in the mid 80s and designed the first fully accessible comprehensive low and high challenge courses. He um, has traveled the world doing this, this programming. He has the Keystone Adventure Program. And he also has worked with Alpine Towers, which we're going to see some, some examples of and some really detailed examples of. It's pretty exciting. His research and writing interests include universal challenge course design and training with families and children with disabilities, as well as recreation therapy interventions for people with disabilities. He's the author of numerous articles. And um, he is married to the lovely Nancy Brayton Rogers. He has two kids. And he is also an avid fisherman. He uh, loves outdoor activity. And he is also um, I think a black belt in martial arts. So please help me welcome Don Rogers to our program. Donnie, thank you. You're welcome. It's great to be here, Candace. <laughs> hey, you know, the only thing I would uh, say on all that, I, I've got to do right by my alma mater. Uh, I got my graduate degrees from Indiana University. And I'm employed oh. here at Indiana State. That's OK. Um, they're only 70 miles away. Uh, people make that mistake, uh, I think, kind of fairly frequently. Yeah, well, uh, honestly, there's, there's such a multitude of 
accolades that you have here as far as, I mean, you are the doctor, you are the professor of outdoor <laughs> recreation. And, and we've had multiple conversations about, you know, what it really does for us and, and how important it is for us. And, and I, I want to know right off, um, were you always an outdoor recreator before your injury, as, and I know as well as after, and where was the first place that you, you found yourself in outdoor recreation and saying, I got I to gotta stick with this after your injury? Um, well, professionally, I, I really wasn't involved in the outdoors prior to my accident. Um, I, was, I, I spent a couple years in the Navy, and uh, I went to school afterwards. Um, I enjoyed the Navy and being around water, and so I, I learned how to build ships and was hired by a company out in Galveston uh, to do that. And I had my accident in Galveston and then went through rehab there in uh, Texas. Now, personally, I, I've always enjoyed the outdoors. I always loved fishing and camping and um, hiking, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, well, you know how it is when you, you know when you acquire a, a disability at some point in your life, you have all these questions, you know, about um, you know what am I going to be able to do and and so forth. And um, that's one thing where I've been just really fortunate. I've been able to uh, maintain you know a connection to my love of the outdoors, and um, as you pointed out, I've been able to parlay that into a full blown career. And um, and it really did uh, start down in Texas. Yeah, well, on multiple levels, you know, um, and I'm really curious. Uh, I put a couple slides up here, uh, indoors, with people, without people. Um, which is better, on my own recreating or with other people? Or, or is it outdoors, uh, on my own or with other people? Well, um, I really would have, you know, I, I would avoid um, any type of categorization like that. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, re, you know, what we do during our leisure is a, a very personal thing. In fact, you know, leisure by definition is, is uh, a situation where you are free to choose uh, what you do uh, with okay. that time. And, um, mm -hmm. Uh, some of us uh, may choose, uh, you know, a competitive sport. Uh, others may want to go outdoors. Others may want to just sit, you know, quietly and uh, take in the day, or read, or sit with a friend and chat. You know, all, all of that stuff is, is is recreation, and it's happening within the context of of leisure. Um, and then, of course, I, we all have our preferences. You know, um, and the neat thing is that you know our our, our preferences tend to bring us into contact with, with others who have similar, you know, preferences and, and that's kind of a, you know, sterile words. You know, I, I would talk about, you know, similar passions, you know what I mean? Uh, similar uh, experiences and uh, desires and because, you know, le leisure and recreation are also very, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved in that. And, and then you bring in the social piece and how it shapes your identity. Uh, you, you tend to meet up with people, you know, again, with similar interests. It, it helped me a lot after my, my accident and getting out in the community. I pretty quickly got involved in wheelchair sports and started doing some track and played basketball. And I met all these folks uh, who were doing the same thing, and they'd gotten on with their lives. You know, they were uh, pursuing an education. Uh, some had started their own businesses, and um, you know, it just—it seemed like a really healthy community of individuals, and um, you know, ir irrespective of, of disability. And um, it, it was. It was a place where I was able to really, you know, thrive uh, and and really, you know, kind of resolve some of my concerns and and, and get in touch uh, even further, you know, w with myself. I mean, uh, you know, the notion of arrested development, you know, uh, disability can potentially have that impact on people. Again, especially if you acquire it at some point in life, especially early in your life. And so, I mean, through all these experiences, I've been able to continue to grow and develop, learn more about who I am and pursue my, my interests, try new things, you know. And, 
you asked the question, I mean, as well earlier, what, you know, why, right? Why, why is this important to us? And in many ways, it's, it's as important to us as it is to everybody else. However, we, you know, you, you just can't ignore uh, the impact of disability. And, and it's hard to, um, you know, impact of disability on health, both physical and mental, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's impact on your ability to be, be, be uh, mobile, to, to be social, um, you know, to continue development, those kinds of things. And if you can get plugged into a, a you know, a, a, again, a, um, a dynamic, supportive, uh, healthy, leisure network, um, it, it's going to help you continue, you know, to, to, to grow and, and, and achieve your potentials. Hello? This is the operator. Are you speaking with me, sir? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not hearing any response. I don't know if I'm I... here. Maybe we lost Candace. Okay. Yes, we lost her. I'm going to dial back out to her. I was about to do that when you said something, but I didn't want to. Okay. <laughs> okay. One moment. All right. No problem. <laughs> Hang in there, John. That's okay. okay. I'd hate to have to try to repeat all that. <laughs> no, we all heard it. Um, Candace probably missed the last little bit of it. That's all right. Well, she's heard it, heard a lot of it before. You, yeah. She mentioned that you have you've been friends for a long time. We have been friends for a long time. We we, um, you know, just got to know each other through sports. So uh, you know, we have had a, especially a lot of mutual friends in sports, and then. Um, our involvement through uh, Turning Point is what really allowed us to spend a, quite a bit more time together, um, getting to know each other and hanging out. Um, yeah, we. Hey, hey, hey there you are. <laughs> I know. I apologize. I totally got dropped, and uh, and uh, I was scrambling looking for the number, and uh, I'm back. I. You were so inspired by my what is, my comments that you were wanted to rush out and do some recreation, right? It's exactly. I had to run outside and um, do some circles and come back because I was thinking I need to recreate. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Um, well, so you know, Candice, I I uh, came back to the original, or at least part of the original question about you know why should we do it uh, as folks okay. with disabilities? Thank you. Um, Addressed that, and and what's it? You know, what do you think the benefit? Um, and and I don't want to compare the two. I, I I think how does one enhance the other recreation wise when you're in the outdoors? Um, what's the enhancement that that we have there when we uh, recreate? Well, um, and that's a you know that's a complex uh, uh, you know answer. Um, because it really isn't just simply, you know, oh, it's indoor or it's outdoor, um, and um, you can compare across the board. Because typically, when we do things indoors, uh, that's a controlled environment, right? Um, right. Yeah, and and uh, maybe you read the book by Richard Louv, um, Last Child in the Woods, and uh, you know the mm -hmm. discussion about how. So many uh, people are uh, not participating in outdoor activities for a variety of reasons. Um, but really what, what happens in the outdoors is a, it's a multi-sensory experience. Uh, so when you go out there to do something, um, you, know, you, you have all of this other sensory input occurring, at, um, and there's less, again, less control over, the, over that environment. Um, which uh, you know, it, I think it adds a very valuable set of uh, features, you know, to to the experience that you're having. And uh, I, there are people that are really drawn to that. You know, they they, they love being they love being in the outdoors uh, because of that, uh, you know, that unpredictability. Uh, you know, maybe it adds a little sense of adventure. Um, and that's you know we talk about adventure you know that um, I mean the essence of adventure and risk is precisely that it is uh, doubt about the outcome 
you know. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. so it's 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 true, like just with the weather, you know, and 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 where you choose to go to uh, participate in something in the outdoors. I've I've had many groups that I've worked with in the outdoors who um, their biggest concern was where they were. You know, do we have anything that we have to be afraid of? Are there bears? You know, are there snakes and, uh, you know, things like that? And, they, you know, they're not thinking so much about the activity. It's the environment that they're in, uh, whereas that wouldn't have been a concern otherwise. And, uh, and for people, people with disabilities, uh, is that something that um, we try to control our environment a little bit more um, just by the nature of the beast? Or do you find when you, you work with people, you know, in the, the Alpine Towers or the uh, universal design of outdoor activity that, that you've been a part of that, as you said, yeah, what, when concerned. I go out and uh, some, you know, one of the things I do initially is uh, survey the site uh, where some, some kind of program or facility is going to be built. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things I look at, but um, what I don't want to have happen is that you know, the ruggedness, if you will, of the site, you know, its level of inaccessibility, particularly when we're talking about people with more severe disabilities, uh, either physical or otherwise, you know, that that, that is really going to be, you know, a, a, a challenge for them, you know. Uh, we want the, the focus of the challenge to be on the their interaction within the group with the you know challenge course itself or whatever else we're talking about in terms of a program you know so we mm-hmm. want to try to make the um, the pathway to there more accessible uh, we want to make the restrooms accessible when we take breaks we want them to be able to you know maneuver around and and, and interact with people without having to needs assistance and worry about you know th- their ability to kind of independently you, you know what I mean uh, move around in that environment uh, so the focus then is on the experience itself uh, outside of kind of the logistics of it, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, I see that. And and so then once our focus is on the experience, uh, what does, you know, I, you, let me just step back a little bit. I've got this, uh, this slide up right now with Alpine Tower, but we also have one of these, which is a, a much, um, not showing up, um, it's a much lower. The okay. Alpine Tower that you have up. Yeah, the Alpine Tower we have up. It it looks pretty extensive. It looks very, uh, I would say, intimidating. Um, well, and, I think, and feel I free think, to, to move I think it's supposed to. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, if I could briefly just kind of say something about that. Remember, you and I talked about how I, I came to that um, uh, that relationship with that organization. Um, um, if we may, go, can we go back one slide on that, Candace? Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. If, you just, uh, if you put your cursor right up into the picture, there will be arrows there, and you can move things back and forth also. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Well, as I said, there was a, um, um, a group, three groups in uh, St. Louis years ago that were um, going to go in together on an Alpine Tower. And the one group worked with people with uh, disabilities and said, you know, they'd be willing to do this as long as uh, th- their folks, uh, that is, the folks with disabilities, could be part of it. And um, so Mike Fischer, the owner of Alpine Towers, um, started asking around about, uh, who, you know, who could help with this, and um, and he found me. And um, I worked uh, with him and his crew uh, to do some things on that initial tower. You'll notice on that picture that there's a, you know, there's a deck, there's a ramp, there's that thing with all the holes in it. If you look mm-hmm. beyond the people, there's another ramp that goes up in, into the interior. Um, and there are really many other things that are built into this that you can't see um, just looking at it casually um, that, that make it a universal design. And um, over the course of two years, um, I completely redesigned the tower uh, to, to we really start calling it the Alpine Tower 2. Because the original tower design only had telephone poles. So none of that other structure was there. There were just three poles going up, and uh, then the cross members at the bottom that formed the, the, the base, and that was it. There was no way if you had, a, especially a physical disability, um, 
that you were going to be able to participate in it, uh, at least not safely, right? Um, my thinking on this uh, was that we, we wanted any group, no matter you know, what their uh, functioning level was, to be able to come up to the Alpine Tower and interact together. So there wasn't a, um, you know, this is for this kind of person and this is that, that kind of person. Anybody could try anything. Over the years, I, I mean, I don't know how many times somebody with no disability at all, um, you know, used what we call the piano, that flat piece there with the holes in it. Um, uh -huh access that mid-level uh, you know of the tower uh, they were intimidated as you suggested by it you know the, you know by the tower and that that platform at the very top is 50 feet off the ground so it's pretty high and uh, yeah yeah and so they would get up there and get onto that uh, there's a little platform you can see someone standing on it in the shadows there uh, just past the top of that uh, that you know that ladder looking thing going up and and they they would you know Say, wow! I didn't, you know, uh, you know, I didn't think I could do this. I'm not comfortable on ladders and so forth. And and they would start feeling, you know, just empowered and a little more courageous. And so now they would try to go ahead and climb up. Where under another design, you know, the original, if they tried to go up one of the legs, which only had little small climbing holes on it, they, you know, there's a great chance that, that they would have not not gotten very far, and that'd have been it. You know what I mean? Um, right, so now right, somebody with a disability I, can yep, get on there, the they can option. climb together, there's just so, and mm -hmm. then there's, again, there's so many things on here you can't see. Uh, I designed something I call the human counterbalance, um, where they're, you know, it's a system where they work with each other to get each other up to the top, counterbalancing each other uh, across okay. the system of pulleys, and uh, it all clips in, and we have a, a four to one mechanical advantage system, so a person can climb with that. Now, it's ironic that some, some, of the, some of our uh, listeners may know of Mark Wellman, a uh, guy that has done some incredible stuff out west climbing the mountains, mm -hmm. and he developed uh, this system uh, using an ascender and a handlebar, you know, where you'd pull up on the rope and pull down and that kind of thing. Um, right. I've uh, actually used that. Is it Jumar? It use, it's, a, it's a modified Jumar. That's right. I, mm -hmm. I designed the exact same thing not having seen his, and I don't, it was right around the same time. I don't know if it was before or after, honestly. Um, but it was, it, just, it was crazy that we both saw this and realized this is what we needed to do. Uh, and I uh -huh. know Mark. I got to know him better, you know, after all that. And uh, we just, you know, kind of chuckle at how that, how that whole thing happened. Um, and, uh, now, looking at, looking at this, what types of disabilities could do this tower, or is it everyone? Everyone. That's the thing. There, everyone. There are systems on here where um, uh, really, I mean, you, you know, you could have no use of your your um, you know your your legs and trunk, and minimal use of your hands and uh, arms, and um, um, and still be able to go up. Obviously, you know, we're going vertical, so uh, you need you're going to have assistance from other folks in your group. Um, but you know, part of the training around this kind of stuff, I mean, it, you know, if you're just using this as recreation, um, then you want everybody to get in there, you know, and have fun and it be safe and, you know, still try to facilitate inclusion to the greatest degree. Um, but if you're trying to do this for team building, which a lot of places do, um, you know, you, you want the experience to, to translate back into some environment, right? Let's say they all work together. Um, so, you know, how do they now interact with a person with a disability who's a, uh, an, you know, a, a fellow employee, right, a colleague at, 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 at that business? Um, y they can go out there and find, you know, new ways to interact in ways that are respectful, that are uh, inclusive, um, and transfer those strategies now back. And the reality is, if you have a disability, you have a disability. You know what I mean? If, if, if there are going to be some things that, that, you know, really are real limits for you and you need help, um, it's okay to get help. Um, but mm -hmm. you need, it needs to happen, again, in a way that uh, is respectful and, and okay and um, with the person, you know, giving it and receiving it. And um, so it really, you know, kind of spreads the responsibility around so everybody's accountable. Um, and, and what I talk about it is that, um, you know, 
if you're trying to come up with an adaptation of some kind uh, within an activity, whatever you come up with, it has to be meaningful, right? That person's okay. role is now will be meaningful in the context of why they are there. You know, the purpose of the program, how they're going to be interacting with folks. It can't be just some, you know, peripheral, you know, sidebar thing. You know, that's you know, stuff like that. You know, what I'm talking about. It, it it becomes artificial sometimes, and all that does mm -hmm. is reinforce stereotypes. And and then they, they start to and now they're going, oh, okay. I you know, I guess uh, the way we've been doing it is kind of how it has to happen, right? So so you're now reinforcing this system you know, back in the workplace or wherever that, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, I don't know, it's, again, it, it's, it's, it's not inclusion in a genuine sense. Right. It's something that they've always done it one way, and, and look, we have to still continue to do that. This, what I hear you saying, it creates this level playing field, and it also has, as you said, meaningful, and there's a contribution that each person is making. There's not one person making more than another or someone making less Absolutely. in a situation you know, like um, this. Yes, I, I, you know, the person with a disability um, needs to probably learn and, and, and try on some new uh, behaviors, some new approaches to how they, you know, interact with, uh, with you know, their, their colleagues and, you know, whoever, you know, maybe their friends or whatever it is, uh, you know, what type of group, uh, as well as the other folks uh, doing the same thing. So it's facilitating this kind of experience, um, you know, it takes some skill. Uh, so the person that's, you know, designing the program and then taking the group out there, um, they really have to have a, a fairly deep understanding of, of what it is that they're trying to get to and, and the methods that are, you know, effective at that. And when you when you run a program, is there a, a sequence of events where, um, as the day goes on, uh, activities get a little bit harder, a little more challenging? Yes, absolutely. Um, we talk a lot about sequencing in um, in, in you know adventure based uh, experiences like this. Um, so you you know you're co constantly looking for ways to kind of tweak things for the individual, uh, making it work for the whole group, uh, taking the skills that they develop in, in in an activity and building on it in the next one. You know, and you you have goals that you're after. Um, so yeah, all day you're trying to you know kind of chain and link things together. You know, uh, sometimes it, you know they talk about funneling. We talk about scaffolding. There are you know a lot of different concepts associated with that. But you know, again, we're, th this is in a situation where you're, you know, a group is there uh, for a specific purpose. You know, <clears throat> they they want this to be a, you know, a, a catalyst for change for them. Uh, in a way that will uh, translate back into some environment uh, where they need to be, you know, working together better in some way, uh, versus just a um, uh, a recreation experience, you know, an adventure recreation experience where, um, it, you know, it, some of the high stuff and the zip line and stuff like that. It just, you know, it's a lot like an amusement ride at that point. Exactly, exactly. And so what I hear you saying with something like this is. It really um, beyond the the physical experience of it. There's this experience of learning how to build relationships, how to collaborate, real life skills that we need to have to put into play um, as we move through our lives and, and through our businesses. So, in something like this, what are what are some of the um, you know some of the health benefits? Um, not just the physical piece of you know learning that you can do something that you you didn't think you could do, but beyond that, the the growth in um, you know kind of mind. Yeah. Um, well, it, that's again part of the beauty of this. Um, you can't control everything about what's going on uh, because in this context, it's experiential learning. Uh, oh, so I hear you say that to, boundaries uh, you boundaries know, are broken. Excuse me. Boundaries are broken. I hear you. I'm hearing you saying because you can't control it. No, you, well, you can't control the experience uh, that your participants are having. You know, as uh, you know, you design something, you want them to be having a certain kind of experience, but uh, there's a very individual and even personal nature, you know, to uh, uh, to what's going on there. Um, but you know what? We, we 
you learn when you do this kind of stuff, and, and I try to teach my students this, that you, you really shouldn't be trying to, to control you know, things that uh, are happening in that way, uh, because that's part of the appeal. You know? um, it's, it's like you've got, a, you've got a tiger by the tail you know, when you're talking about fun, exciting, uh, you know, immersive, uh, inclusive recreation experiences, whether it's um, adventure or not. And, and what I mean by that is that you know, as a, the person you know, that's leading it and designing it, you know, you, you know, this, you, the metaphor, you got the tiger by the tail, I mean, you can choke up on that tail all you want, you know what I mean? But you, <laughs> you, you really never can control it, you know what I mean? You're, in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you're along for the ride uh, just like everybody else. Uh, so you're there to maybe guard certain boundaries uh, about the experience, certainly keep everybody safe. That's your number one priority, uh, and help encourage people to be involved and engaged, you know. Um, and, um, you know, if you've done a good job of the, of the design, you've done a good job assessing the people that are coming, um, you know, it, more than likely it's going to be successful. And it's going to be a, a multidimensional experience for everyone. And this would come to your question about indoor outdoor you know I mean the, that that outdoor piece with all those other you know things about the outdoor that come into play it uh, just adds you know in my mind um, more richness uh, to the experience unless you know there's a need to control it you know like like doing something in a gymnasium or something like that right then maybe there's a danger aspect to it for instance you know all the, the safety equipment that you use for something like this everyone has hard hats on um, there's a is there an explanation of how it's all working and and why it's working when when you start a program like this? Absolutely. Um, on, you know, one level, uh, we we explain the equipment. We talk about the safety features of all of it. Um, everybody's wearing a helmet. Helmets are primarily there for, uh, and, and they're used in climbing for this. Primarily, is for uh, to protect you against something that's falling from above. Um, so if you've got okay. people up on the tower or up on a wall or up on the rock, uh, you know, stuff can get knocked down on you and it protects you from that. Um, but people like putting on the hard hat, you know, the helmet, the climbing helmet and the, and the harness. Um, um, I remember doing building some of this kind of stuff in uh, long-term care facilities, and uh, we would get everybody together, and they would, we'd put on harnesses, and we'd have rope out there, and helmets, and carabiners, and uh, cl clip them on at, at least a couple of them, so they'd you know be clinking together, and every you know it, it was fun, and, and then they'd get pictures taken afterwards, and have them in their room. And I got some feedback that you know they would show them to their families when they came in, and everybody was you know passing around looking at at Grandma in the, in, the, in her complete climbing <laughs> outfit, you know. Uh, so it just you know it, there's a reason for it from a safety standpoint, but it's also part of the identity you know associated with exactly with doing this kind of thing, you know. Right, exactly. You know, putting the, the uniform on or the costume on to to get in the in the persona, and yeah. um, I'm thinking that. Some of this this uh, gear that's put on can also uh, inspire someone to to be a little more courageous, you know, a little bit braver, to push their limits a little bit. Um, you You're know, right, and I think dressed, um, dressed for success, so to speak. Dressed for success. That's, I, I, that's, I like that application here in this. Um, um, you know, there's a concept um, that's um, activity before affect. Um, where you know, if you wait for somebody to be ready, you know, to do something, you know, if you wait for them to finally say, "Okay, I'm ready to do it. All right, I'll go," you know, something like that, you you may wait forever. It may never happen. Um, what we sometimes what has to happen is the person has to get involved. And then as soon as you get involved, like in this case, you start putting the helmet on and the harness on and being around the equipment, it, it is activating emotions for you. It's activating thoughts, uh, memories. Um, it's, it's stimulating you know, new things maybe that you haven't felt before or thought before. And, and it's completely changing you know, the way you look at the situation. Uh, so that, you know, it, again, that affect now uh, starts to control your action. It starts to control control your readiness, your willingness, you know, to, to, to be engaged. Um, you know, it's like the person that says, you know, 
they just never wanted to try something. And then they finally try it and they go, wow, that's fantastic. You know, I really love it. God, I wish I'd done that 10 years ago, you know. Um, well, uh -huh. you know, that's, it's, that's a very real thing for, for people. Right, right. The um, fears and the, the blocks that we put in place are, are, are very real. They're, they're, um, they're the things that, you know, for some reason we have them in place and maybe they kept us safe at, at one point in our lives and they may not have any use anymore. And so an activity like this seems like it could really break down some of those, uh, those, those barriers that we've put in that yes. really aren't serving us anymore. And, and, and isn't that a, wouldn't that be a great takeaway? You know, mm -hmm. if, you know, we don't we don't claim that this stuff works miracles. You know, um, we only have folks involved maybe for a few hours or a whole day. You know, if you're lucky, you can get multiple contact with folks. And the research shows that you know the more contact over time that you have, the more power this stuff has to affect change. You know, more lasting change anyway. It's a good it's a great diagnostic tool uh, in, in the short term. That's for sure. But but if you know, if the one takeaway is, um, wow, you know, how many other things in my life am I afraid of or saying no mm -hmm. to uh, that I actually might enjoy and be able to do, you know? Right, um, getting people to, uh, to, to question. That's right, you know, exactly. Some of their habits and behaviors and, and whether they're serving them or not. And, yes. and, and, you know, maybe they need to be able to push, you know, push that level a little bit. And so... An activity like this really, um, I think, just looking at the tower um, is intimidating, and uh, and then and then actually thinking that you're going to be uh, climbing on it somehow probably takes people way over the top. I can see high fives happening all yes. over the place uh, so <laughs> at an event like this. <laughs> I, I wish I wish I had tape recorded or video. I'm sorry, you know, videotaped so many things over the years. Uh, I mean, I, I've been in trainings and, and worked with groups where it just, you know, literally brought me to tears, uh, uh, as well as a lot of people around me. Just the, the really neat stuff, you know, that that happens out there. You know, it's just um, really genuine. Mm -hmm. You know, deeply human. Uh, it's it's exactly the kind of stuff that you're looking to have happen out there. Yeah. You know, you talk about risk and. Um, what we talk about in the challenge course field anyway, adventure field in general, is um, there's two kinds of risks. Uh, there's, there's actual risk, right? And we try to, you know, we calculate for that. We try to minimize that. We manage that. Uh, and then there's perceived risk. And that's oh, what lives okay. within the individual, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, y they may be in a situation where they are extremely safe. No scenario that they have in their mind that they are afraid of could possibly happen, you know what I mean, because of the equipment and everything else that's going on, the way things are designed. But they don't, you know, they still have that fear. And, and right. you have to, you know, you have to respect that, that they have that fear and be careful about how much perceived risk they are experiencing. Um, but you need that there, you know. So we, we're, we make these things really safe, but when you start going up high or going over edges or around edges and doing things, even though all the equipment's there to keep you safe, you know, the person is still afraid. And that's what gets people kind of squirming a little bit, you know. It gets feelings bubbling up to the surface. And, you know, the old ways of trying to, uh, you know, get back into your comfort zone and deal with anything that is happening uh, either verbally or otherwise, it's not working anymore, you know, and uh, so you, you've got to open up and, and start accommodating to other people's ideas and, 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 and these different feelings and pairing new actions, you know what I mean, with these feelings mm -hmm. and, and, and with those interactions with uh, other people. Um, it, it's, it's a very dynamic, um, you know what I mean, multi-layered kind of, kind of experience. I, and I'd like to just hear some thoughts from you about the the world we live in now and and so many people spend so much time um, you know behind a computer uh, at their desks and um, our forefathers created created parks in in large cities I think so that we could have the national experience how important do you think these type of experiences are now um, you know compared to even 50 years ago when we were much more active outside well that's you know 
I have a lot of thoughts and feelings <laughs> about that. Um, you know, one of the first things I, I think of is I, I'm a father. You know, I have uh, two children that are young teenagers, and um, watching them, um, you know, with all of their electronics um, and how, you know, my wife and I really work to, to, to manage that piece and try to create some balance in their lives. And, um, you know, we're fortunate. We live near a park. You know, I think it's, it's really important to, to encourage people to use parks. There's, there's a lot of research around, around parks and, and, and how it connects to healthy neighborhoods. And uh, honest, neighborhoods that have ready access to parks, uh, there, is, there are lower crime rates. Uh, there are greater uh, reports of, if, you know, there are reports of greater satisfaction, uh, of, of more, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of, you know, enjoyment in, in that particular community, with the community. Um, but my kids, I, 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 they have this balance. They play sports. Uh, they go to the park. They ride their bikes. We take them on, vac you know, we go on vacations, and um, we, we, you know, really minimize the use of the electronics during that time and try to em emphasize the other stuff that we're doing. But then we let them have their time with it, too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm seeing some kids, you know, now growing up, uh, right, that are, in my mind, uh, pretty healthy. When, they, when they're left now to, to some of their own choices, um, they, they, they tend to choose a balance. Um, but not everybody has that opportunity, you know, and not every family has those resources. So in a way, we're, you know, you know fortunate. Um, I mentioned earlier, Richard Louvre, you know, The Last Child in the Woods, the, the subtitle to that was, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the emergence of, uh, um, oh, what they call it, uh, uh, are you familiar with that book, Candace? Yes, yes. Yeah, what, what is the uh, deficit, what is it? Oh, Nature Deficit Disorder. I'm sorry, I couldn't. Yes, think. exactly, Nature Deficit Disorder. And, the and there, there's scientific studies all over now about they're, that. They're, they're, and they've been around for a while. I mean, you know, they, they have studies where they look at people in the workplace. If you can sit at a window and look out on a natural view, uh, you, that you tend to report greater levels of satisfaction with your job, uh, you tend to be more productive, and you tend to report lower levels of stress associated with your job. Uh, they've mm -hmm. got uh, schools where these kids have uh, access to, um, it, you know, nature-based experiences, uh, not just going on a playground, but, you know, doing things out in nature uh, that are, you know, purposely designed for that. Uh, they tend to do better across the entire curriculum, and they have fewer uh, behavioral issues in those schools. I mean, you know, and they control for these other variables in there. Some pretty solid science around this stuff. And uh, There um, is, there is. There's we need to be really paying attention science. to that. You're absolutely right, and I'm glad you you answered my question that way because uh, it makes me think about back uh, in 2001. I had uh, I was going to have a, a big surgery, and I was looking for all these different ways I could heal while um, uh, after the surgery. And one of the things that that came up over and over were putting pictures of water, moving water, waterfalls, and nature pictures on my walls and being able to look at those would lower my, my cortisol levels, my stress levels, and uh, raise my ability to heal. So mm -hmm. that, you know, you saying that, you know, with schools now, they're, they're seeing with studies that, you know, having that, just being able to look out the window and, and then to get out into the environment is, is having a huge impact on, um, on, you know, just their lives and also building relationships with other people. Yeah, definitely, and and you know, uh, tying this back uh, into folks with disabilities. I mean, um, mm -hmm. when you think about diff all the different situations, um, you know, that folks with you know so many different kinds of disabilities find themselves in, um, re you know, related to constraints perhaps that are uh, connected either directly or indirectly with the disability, um, they may have limited access to two parks, uh, to transportation, um, to mm -hmm. inclusion in vacations or other types of, you know, trips or packages, you know, at their work and, you know, all kind of ways where they additionally get kind of cut out of the opportunities. And, and now you're, you're talking about people, you know, who 
as much, if maybe sometimes more than others, uh, need an opportunity. You know what I mean? To go into an environment that uh, they can interact with in, in ways that activate other senses. You know that that it's just not a, an environment where you, your mobility is the key to your, you know, uh, you, you know your 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 ability to you know kind of enjoy that that space you know or enjoy that experience or for just that time that you have there um, you know you, and you get out there and you, and you make choices and, and any limitations when you go out in, into nature that are there uh, are not uh, so much artificial anymore right they're not imposed upon you by uh, by the constructed environment so uh, you know you kind of negotiate with those kinds of you know environmental barriers with I think with a different attitude you, you know mm -hmm. you understand that it's just it's part of nature and I'm going to I'm going to you know kind of find a way you know if I can I, I, I've and so I know uh, a friend of mine who's passed away a number of years ago John Gallen he and I used to uh, go out into the woods and go into the most inaccessible of places and fall out of our chairs, get all muddy, push and hack and, and you know, really back then, you know, nowadays it would be looked at as irresponsible, uh, but, you know, we, you know, in terms of the impact, but just, you know, we loved getting out there and doing that. It was the, the kind of struggle that, that we embraced, you know, that, that uh, you know, we, we just felt so good about. And um, But you put either one of us, into a, a, an art, you know, a man-made environment uh, that was inaccessible, and, and you, get, you get a different feeling from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But do you, so I would think that you know, when we talk about accessible, um, there's this this whole uh, buzzword called inclusive. But um, I'm going to transition a little bit where you talked about there's a difference with universal design and accessible design, and 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 those. The differences with them, and and one with universal design is is much more, you know, back to the buzzword inclusive. But along the lines of what you were just saying, you know, that you go out into a natural environment, and you and John really tried to push yourselves out there, and you would struggle when you got into a man-made environment, possibly. Those kind of skills can transfer over if it's a universally designed environment, right? Well, you know. Yes, I, I would. I would much rather we pursue the concept of universal in, in how we design our environments um, than than accessible. Um, you know, accessible is just a, a concept that is um, uh, you know kind of part of this idea of universal, and um, you know we had to start somewhere. And uh, we mm -hmm. started with accessible, and, and that's great. You know, I'm, you know, we're all fortunate to some degree. You know, if we have a disability, that we, um, you know, live in this day and age, and, and even in this country, um, you know, to have an environment that's as accessible as it is. I know we still have a long way to go, um, but but you know, there are places around the world that are leapfrogging the. Um, um, this idea of accessible and, and, and trying to go straight to universal, um, and that's oh you know, okay yeah that happens you know with a lot of things you know with uh, you know the, some countries in, in energy infrastructure or economics or whatever you know you you kind of learn from uh, how all of us modern folks uh, have struggled and finally got <laughs> to something that's better and they go we we think we'll do that instead you know uh, right right we don't need to make those uh, we don't need to make those steps because it's Right. Time consuming and, and also yes. you know. So there are international <laughs> excuse me, there are international efforts to promote universal design and, and, and try to kind of, you know, uh, explain it and operationalize it uh, you know, in, into our our built environments. Um, so yeah, you know you again it, it um, when we talk about the outdoors a lot of folks are um, you know, they don't want to see much change in the outdoors so that we can accommodate the needs of people with disabilities, you know. Um, you remember back when the ADA was passed and, and we started talking about applying that into the state, into the parks and stuff, and uh, the, the cry went out, uh, you know, about paving the wilderness, you know. Um, right. And, and that, that's, not what, that's not what, you know, I think, you know, 
most people wanted that, that enjoyed you know the outdoors. They just wanted um, you know more access to it. So if we're going to go out and do some, um, if we're going to you know go into an area and develop it uh, so that people can have access, then we need to consider the needs of all people when we do that, and we can do that in a way that's also universal. Um, it is not exclusively a, a concept for the, you know, the, the, the heavily built environment. It can apply anywhere where we're making modifications. Um, exactly, and and you know the idea, the whole idea of paving the wilderness. There's a lot of surfaces that are now available that are are you know environmentally friendly, and they also create a nice firm surface for someone to be able to. Have really good mobility on when when they might have some kind of mobility impairment, or you know, even families going out with their strollers or someone with a walker. Uh, all those things are are readily available now, uh, as far as different surfaces that will interact with the environment, so that um, it doesn't look like someone built a road through it. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, and and I think there's you know I think that's a great example of the you know the level of sensitivity to that issue, you, you know uh, the folks at the National Center on Accessibility, uh, you know they worked a lot with Pete Axelson over the years, and uh, and and I was involved in some of the research that happened there at uh, Bradford Woods when uh, NCA was there, looking at different surfaces, and uh, there, there was you know there were some very creative things going on around that, and some of it's been successfully applied, you, you know. Um, you know, another example too is, is like with golf. You, you know, the, the people, you know, they were concerned about people with disabilities participating in golf, you know, um, because of the, the two main issues were pace of play and um, the impact on the greens of these uh, single player carts, right? <clears throat> well, you know, they did the research, and in fact, um, um, it didn't, you know, significantly. Uh, changed the pace of play, and these single player cars were designed so that they didn't negatively impact the greens. You know, so it's mm -hmm. uh, you know you go back to the tragedy, really, in my mind, of Tracy Martin. You know, who tried to you know uh, have a, a professional career. He had a degenerative disease, and you know people within the sport, you know, resisted uh, his involvement, and their voices were, you know, strong enough. Um, uh, to keep him out of it, uh, when it, when finally you know the court case uh, decided in his favor, uh, it was too late for him. You know, right? He couldn't play at that level anymore. It's just uh, you know, time time in this case is is really important for a lot of people. We right, got, we and got to um, move this stuff forward. You know, we do. We have to move it forward because, um, um, as you said, I don't, I'm sorry, I said essence. Tracy. I meant Casey uh, Martin. Mm -hmm. Casey Martin, right? That's a whole different thing. But uh, <laughs> with Casey, you know, and the resistance. So, and I see we're just like totally running out of time. Um, but with the resistance, how do we inspire? You know, the seven other the there's seven billion people in the world. A billion have disabilities. There's six billion. How do we inspire the six billion to really embrace universal design and and have ownership with it that you know want to make these changes. Mm. Any any ideas on that? Well, I, I think um, I, I I think we need a team. You know what I mean? Take a team approach. Uh, the thing that made the ADA so successful was the fact that a lot of people with disabilities, right, uh, were as much a part of moving it forward and determining what it was um, as folks without disabilities, you know, uh, folks that were allies and just, you know, kind of had a sense about what the right thing to do was, you know. Um, so we, we have to be a very powerful voice in, in, in advocating for this idea of universal design. Um, and I think we need to uh, try to evolve um, legislation in that direction, um, even to the even to the point of, of changing uh, the language. You know, language is so important in, in what we do and, and how we communicate with folks. Um, you know, 
when you have complex ideas that also have um, you know terms associated with them that that have you know layered meaning uh, that has to be explained. Uh, you, you know, I don't think you're, you're going. You're not going to get very far very quickly with that. We we see that right. in our politics and, um, and and so many other places. Um, um, you know, you, you just you need to kind of crack the door open uh, with things that that get people uh, thinking about. You know, again, maybe doing doing the right thing and. Um, just grasping a little bit of what it is that you're you're trying to to communicate, you know, um, it's like you know, person first language, and how the government adopted that, you know, it's um, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and um, you know, th just simple things like that, that that get people thinking a little differently, and um, you know, using using language that they can that they can understand, and this notion of universal. If you if you went out and asked you know 20 people on the street what universal design meant, you'd probably get 20 different answers, right? If you talk right. about accessibility though for people with disabilities, you might get you know. Uh, Ten different answers. Uh, you know, they they can relate to you know the, some can relate to the ADA and ramps and parking and you know things in the bathroom and so forth. So um, we, we need to we need to embark on a on a on a on a process of of, of education and and transformation uh, around how we approach uh, you know accessibility for people with disabilities and really start focusing on this idea of inclusion uh, more than just uh, individual access. Right, and so in the you know in the uh, energy of inclusion, we have a question from someone, Kathleen, saying she um, you know for kayaking and hand cycling, and, and I'm just asking you to put your thinking cap on here, Don. Is she was saying that she doesn't she doesn't have friends and family that are readily available to help her, and she needs assistance. Are there any groups that you you know, can think of that she would connect with to be able to get that kind of assistance. You know, I was thinking YMCA or, or oh, even you know. Absolutely, um, there is an organization out there um, that was developed to assist uh, veterans with disabilities, but. Um, they are encouraged, every chapter in the country is encouraged to include anybody with disability uh, in their program, and it is specifically uh, targeting kayaking and canoeing oh, okay. for people with disabilities, and it's called Team River Runner. Team River Runner. And uh, they have uh, a website out there, and you can go into the area that uh, 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 identifies all the chapters, and it has all the contact uh, uh, information for those chapters. And um, you could find somebody close to you. Um, and even if a chapter is too far away, uh, it's very likely that they will know somebody even closer um, that, that they could put you in touch with. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll we'll put that up on our on our resource page. And as I'm flipping through the slides that unfortunately we didn't get to, I wanted to ask you: Is this something? These courses that are in the slides, is this something that someone, say myself in a wheelchair, uh, could do on my own? Could I go out there and? Typically and not. Uh, again, typically because not. of okay. the. Um, you know the the risk that's involved, uh, and in this case, I'm talking about the real risk. You know, um, uh -huh. where you know where there are safety procedures and and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, you, you just typically can't get access to this stuff. Um, okay. You usually, almost almost always, actually, have to be part of a a, a group. You know, that goes there and participates in it. Um, but you know, there there's. You know, zip lines, uh, eco tourism, uh, canopy tours, you know, all kind of terms for it. But <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of this kind of stuff out there where they, uh, that has gr uh, grown out of the uh, uh, challenge course uh, field, um, and is uh, they're a large part of the Association for Challenge Course Technology now. You can find them on the web also, um, where they uh, are. Pursuing ways to include people with disabilities, and they're borrowing some of the techniques that that we uh, developed in the challenge course industry. 
uh, so folks can get up there and uh, you know just have fun. You know, you show up and uh, you, you you pay and and you go. You know, so you don't have to come in with some group or make reservations or you know mm -hmm. anything like that. So that would be an individual thing, and and then um, I do understand now yeah, the safety aspect of of being able to you know get on something like this and and making sure everything is yeah. you know. It's safe and, and everybody gets through it easily. This slide, I and I'm just going to take a few more minutes of your time here. That's this fine. slide, what is this slide? Say it again, the zip line? No, this uh, this slide that I have up right oh, here. Oh, what is up. this slide? OK. Yeah, um, this slide. <laughs> gotcha. I, I got I, it. I, I wasn't line. looking at it. I was you know, focused on the phone. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, this is part of a course that I designed uh, many years ago. You mentioned in my bio working with uh, Roland and Associates. Uh, Chris Roland um, uh, got a contract uh, with a, a national um, rehabilitation uh, corporation, and they were interested in having something like this. And uh, it, it was interesting. He got the contract before there was a course. And then he asked me if I would design a course. And um, so, uh, so I did. And that's what you're seeing in these pictures. Um, the thing okay. is, is that we, you know, my thinking, I, I didn't want to just go in there and build all this stuff out of wood, you know, like you would normally do at a camp or somewhere. Uh, and then they kind of stand back and look at it. And, you know, and they just paid over $100,000 for it and go, well, my gosh, we <laughs> Our, our maintenance crew could have built that. So I started looking at uh, new surfaces, like on here, uh, the, the slide you have up there, um, you know, that is a, um, um, a plastic type coat, uh, you know, sheet that is anchored down to it. Um, but you know, as I, as I started looking at it more, um, I felt that you know, it, it's safer than the wood. And, and when you're looking at using that in a rehab setting, um, you know, the, the, if the person slides across there, they're not going to get splinters. You know what I mean? Um, mm, absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be more sterile or you know, more clean, uh -huh. I should say. Uh, easier to clean after people have used it, if there have you know, been accidents or fluids of any kind, whatever. And then if you look around the edge, uh, uh, that is that molding on there is designed to uh, help against impact. So if a person's still trying to learn how to transfer, you know, uh, out of their chair onto another surface, um, you know, they, they bump themselves a little bit. It, it you know, won't uh, create, uh, you know, a contusion or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really. I mean, it, that's such a great idea, and I can see how those surfaces cover each one of those platforms. Right. And uh, and then and then this uh, this last slide where it looks like a teeter totter. So is that you know an it's, idea? it's interesting. <laughs> you know we're kind of ending on this. Um, when I I did my undergraduate at the University of North Texas, as you mentioned, and um, hmm. I I did it at uh, my internship uh, for that degree at Bradford Woods, and and they. You know, I had to do a project, an intern project, and that's what mm -hmm. I did right there. I designed that, and um, I wanted a challenge course uh, event that could be used there at that camp for the kids with disabilities. And um, as you look at that, it's got all those notches and different things under there. And we talked earlier about sequencing. You see those boards that are under there. One of them's laying on the side to the left. Uh, the board has a notch in it, and depending on which end you have it standing on, it controls the movement of the uh, of the of the platform, you know, that you're up on. So it can, mm -hmm. you know, go fully uh, teeter totter. It can go uh, one third or two thirds of it. You see what I mean? So it can uh -huh. control the amount of of movement on there. Um, and then you got obviously the ramps going on and off, and the handrail. Uh, you can put a mat down in there. A person can be out of their chair, um, you know, uh, doing some stuff on there. Um, there's just, you know, you can have multiple people on there. Um, I have used that picture before to show that you know, the amount of weight that it can carry because it's got a, a significant steel uh, structure underneath of it. Um, it's just been a really successful element. I've adapted it in a number of ways and put it into camps and uh, on regular challenge courses and, and things like that, and used it with folks without disabilities at all. Uh, so in, mm -hmm. in that way, it, you know, it, it is universal. Right, and 
it's uh, I mean, it's it looks so simple. It looks such like a simple piece of of equipment that has multiple uses, and 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 that's I mean, that just reminds me of the outdoors and and recreation. Anyways, it's is really it's it's pretty simple. It doesn't need to get too complicated, and that we can we can really get out and experience to whatever level we feel comfortable, and and also push ourselves a little bit. Yeah. To you know, to be able to you know expand what our abilities are, and uh, and all of this this equipment and this information and and um, this time that we've spent with you right now has really expanded my mind as far as um, how parks and um, you know recreation facilities could really have more inclusive activity going on, and Absolutely. and I really appreciate that. And, yeah, and, and it, you know the. It, it doesn't have to be high tech, you, you know. Right. Uh, you know, we, we didn't even get it, it, into a discussion about recreation therapy, but you know, one of the things we say in recreation therapy is that we're uh, we're low tech, high touch, you know. And uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, the same thing can be true in the in the recreation setting. It's not uh, it, it's it's not something that it requires a, a whole lot of extra training uh, to to facilitate uh, or expensive equipment to to deliver. Um, you know, there are, certainly there are some things you need to know, and uh, you need to know who's coming. You absolutely need to have some form of assessment in place. Um, but once you've done it uh, for a while and, and you get input, you know, it, and again, this should be a collaborative deal. You know, involve people with disabilities in the process of, of, of putting this stuff together and figuring out how to do it. And um, as I've said all, you know, many times, you know, safety is, is critical. You've got to make sure that, that people are safe. And because uh, when people are safe, then, then you can experiment, you can explore, you know what I mean, uh, mm -hmm. within the context mm -hmm. of that and, and, and find out, you know, what kind of things work and, 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 and the different effects that, that things have. And that's, and that's important. Yeah, and, you know, what you said about uh, including people with disabilities, you know, nothing about us without us. And, and this is a... This show has been a real example of you know someone with a disability yourself and and people that you've worked with being able to expand you know what people feel is the outdoors and and activity in the outdoors and really really appreciate you taking the time with us and as always, Mr. Rogers, I could go on and on and on speaking with you because of the you know just the the passion that you have for it, but also the wealth of knowledge that you have. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it with us. Well, Candace, I appreciate you having done what it took to get in a position to provide, you know, this and, and so many more of these kind of programs, uh, you know, out there to other folks with disabilities and, 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 and other people in general. Um, this is exactly what I was talking about. We need to be educating folks and um, uh, making the connection. So I, I really appreciate it.